Hey, you're listening to the Road to a Billion podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Georgia, and I'm glad to have you with me here today. The Road to a Billion is a call-in radio show where you can ask me questions about freelancing, copywriting, entrepreneurship, mindset, scaling funnels, relationships, money, and more. The reason for the name of Road, The Road to a Billion is twofold. One is because I am going to reach a billion dollars in sales this year for both my own products and products uh, wherever in copy for clients. And also because my goal is to have a direct impact on the life of a billion people over the next 20 years. And really nowadays, I'm hoping that's going to be 10 or five years. I keep accelerating that timeline. We're going to start taking calls in about five minutes from now. And the way it works is that we're going to put your, you'll put your questions into the Q&A section in Zoom here. And then my good friend, Ed Ray, who just had a birthday yesterday, is going to be reviewing these questions and feeding them to me. Ed, you want to go ahead and say hi and maybe share something that you've, you've learned as you're a year older and wiser now at the ripe mm. old age of 20? Oh, man. Oh, dude, I'm over the hill already. <laughs> I'm over the hill already. Um, <laughs> that's how it feels. Uh, so, well, first, hi, I'm Ed. Uh, I help make people's funnels Facebook friendly so they can get some of those suck bucks. Uh, yes, suck bucks. It's real currency. <laughs> so, I think one of the biggest things that I've really learned this past year, which I'm definitely going to do a whole Facebook post about it today, uh, is just to really enjoy the process. Like, chill out, just enjoy and trust the process. That's really the number one thing I could definitely share with people. Because uh, I've, I've spent my whole life living in the future. You know, I would always be looking for that next client. I'd be looking for that, the next thing that's going to make me happy. The next thing that's going to finally, uh, you know, make me feel like I'm good enough. But it's like, why, why can't I be good enough right now? Why can't I love who I am, but also love who I'm becoming? Why can't I love what I'm doing and then love what I'm going to do? Why can't I love the struggle because looking back at it now, the struggle is actually the most fun part because it's like, I don't know, maybe that's just like the daredevil in me, but it's like, you don't know if that client is going to land, which is like the most important thing in your world. And you don't know if you're going to eat tomorrow. I mean, thankfully I didn't have that issue, but like some people do experience that. And that's just part of the grind. And that is something to enjoy because we learned so many incredible lessons by going through hardship. We learned so many incredible lessons by not feeling good enough. We go through so many incredible lessons by feeling rejected. And I'm this past year, I've definitely learned to really enjoy the process, appreciate it and love my life as it is and keep moving forward. So it'll be how I want it to be. That well, it's fantastic. That was very, very wise. Wise beyond your 20 years and amazing. Really, really good. Um, I think uh, I couldn't agree more, honestly. Like, oh, and by the way, Ed says, please give me uh, the hosting powers. So I'm going to do that too. But no, Ed, that was, that was uh, tremendous. Really good. Um, let me make Ed a co-host. There we go. No, John, I'm not available for bar mitzvahs. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and well, cool. We'll talk more about what you've learned probably on today's show. Uh, so we'll start taking calls in just a couple minutes here. Again, put them in the QA and Ed will, you know, when you submit a question, Ed will call your name, give some background on your question. Then he'll unmute you. You have a chance to explain the context and the background of your question in more detail. And then we'll talk through it together and help to provide insights or, you know, if possible a resolution to your question. So I see you already got stuff in there in the, in the QA section already have questions coming in, which is awesome. And we'll, we'll get to as many as we can in the next hour and 20 minutes or so. Uh, before we do the thing I, I want to kind of talk about today and what I'm sort of been thinking about, uh, is really about embracing change and that that's a reality and that like, uh, you can fight it or embrace it. So, this came about for a couple of reasons. Uh, I'm reading a book called 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by, I'm going to butcher his name, so I'm going to quickly Google it. It's the same guy who wrote Sapiens, if you've ever, uh, uh, Yuval Harari. Yeah. So dude is, is very, uh, is brilliant. Sapiens is a really good book. And then this one about 21 Lessons for the 21st Century 
is essentially all of the ways that society and life and technology, how all these things are going to change in the 21st century and how our lives are going to change. And he talks about, uh, you know, I'm not super deep and I'm like only a hundred pages into it or whatever, but, um, he like, he's talking about like a lot of automation, right. And AI and algorithms and how they're going to make increasingly more decisions for us. And, and a lot of it to me is honestly scary and anxiety inducing, uh, you know, an example he talks about, and this is totally true is how, as people trust algorithms to make more and more decisions, right, then your freedom of choice or the illusion of of freedom of choice kind of goes away. So for example, like an algorithm in the future could conceivably tell you what career to have or who to marry or all this kind of stuff. And I personally don't like that. I don't really, that that future is scary to me and I'm resistant to it. Uh, But he he also points out people who say, oh, we'll never do that. He mentions like an example like Google Maps, right? And how the first time you use like, Google and it tells you to go right instead of left on your commute to work. And you say, uh, no, I go left and you go left, you get in traffic and you miss like an important meeting. And the next day you follow the algorithm and go right and you avoid the traffic and make it in time to the, to the meeting. And from then on, you start actually following it. And as crazy as it is, he cites an example uh, from a few years back where some, I think there were Japanese tourists were in uh, Australia and they drove their car into the ocean and the reason why is because they were trying to get to some obscure like island and the driver who is a 21 year old woman said how she's like, well, the, the map, Google maps told me to just keep going that way. So I just followed it. And she's like literally drove into the ocean and it sounds crazy, but there's actually all these documented cases of people driving into bodies of water because their Google maps told them to do it. So that part is like gnarly and not cool. And frankly, it's, um, it's scary, but that being said, we also have to look at for the fact that like change and innovation are going to happen no matter what. That doesn't mean we have to blindly accept whatever, because the the scary question that gets raised is, is it's not just the algorithms, but it's who controls the algorithms, who programs it. And the people who do that, like the Google's, Facebook's, whatever the world, uh, uh, whatever of the world, like may then, you know, they can control us. So so, so there's a, a scary component to it, but regardless, like transformation and change is going to happen. So, and it's been happening for forever. So you, you can't just sit there and purely resist stuff because you don't like change. You have to figure out a way to adapt as well. Um, if you look at the inception of the telegraph, for example, I wrote, there's another book I read back in the day called uh, The Information. And it's like an actual history of information and how it's evolved over the years and all this stuff. And uh, you know, when the telegraph came out, people were thought it was like the end, like, oh, no one's going to even have communications. No one's even going to talk anymore. Cause like, you know, now that you can just telegraph somebody, like nobody will even have like in-person conversations. People were scared of like the telegraph, which seems so quaint and cute today compared to cell phones where we've said the same thing. And then we'll say it about whatever new technology comes out. So there's always going to be new technologies coming out and we're always going to be resistant. I think about the Uber drivers, or sorry, I think about the taxi drivers in New York who were committing suicide when Uber was able to come in and start taking up like ground in, in New York. And it's really, it's very sad. Anyone killing themselves, the loss of life, it's always really sad, but it's also mind blowing to me because it's like, it's like, you can't just like, because whatever you were doing was like protected for a period of time. Like, and now it's not like, and then your only option now is to kill yourself. Like I, you know, that's crazy. Like that's, that's, a, it's, it's very hard for me to comprehend that. And I think now about what's going on with COVID and the economy shutting down again, and the fact that American Airlines may be about to lay off 8,800 flight attendants, Cirque du Soleil just laid off 3,300 employees. Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to get laid off and lose their jobs, and they can either sit there and think about how they're, you know, a victim or they got screwed or how events were beyond their control, and they can sort of let that dictate the rest of their life, or they can embrace the moment and embrace new opportunities like freelancing e-commerce, digital marketing, uh, learning new skills, things of that nature, and they can adapt with the times and leverage technologies and continue to thrive. And I just think it's really important as we go through this phase we're at as a society where I, uh, we really need to, uh, to adapt and to embrace these things. So that's kind of just it for, uh, for today, but um, for the monologue, I guess. But I just think it's like an important point, something to keep in mind is like, there's no like resistance rarely is valuable or gets you anywhere. Um, you know, it's much better to kind of adapt with the times again, not blindly, but to at least like, uh, you know, at least 
be open to it. And otherwise, you know, you get stuck. I mean, even with copy, like just one more point, like think about copy. You've got all people who did like infomercials who I've talked to who are like struggling with infomercials and you know, you're like, Oh, you could just go online. They're like oh, online. I don't know how to do that. And it's like, it's not, it's like not that hard. You know, like I just, you write a script, you shoot a video or you put it up as like a designed letter. You send traffic to it with a checkout page and you sell stuff. Like it's not that hard, but for somebody, and I know guys who used to do infomercials who have adapted and who do great. And I know guys who, and girls who used to do infomercials and who like just sort of gave up and went and got like a job as an insurance salesperson because times changed. And same thing with direct mail. And direct mail still works, but like I know people who, you know, crush it direct mail and they're like, why, well, you know, I can't do this digital stuff. It's such bullshit, right? Like it's not like it's, it's not hard. You just have to, and as soon as you actually do something, as soon as you take that step, it becomes way easier because the, the big important thing is like this fear of the unknown is always like way greater than the actual struggle will be once you embrace the unknown. Another example, I talked to somebody yesterday who was afraid of embracing working with affiliates for his stuff. And I told him about how with my first health supplement company, the first year we grossed a million dollars back in 2015 and lost 200,000. And I thought I was gonna have to quit and go be a copy chief and whatever. And a part of it was because I was so afraid of, of, of working with affiliates. And I was thought, you know, I, I gave all these excuses that were not at all based on any experience. It was just kind of like whatever fears I had, I used those excuses. Uh, but then I looked at the model of what I was doing and said, wow, this isn't sustainable. Something has to change. And then I embraced affiliates, kind of developed relationships, figured out how to work with them, how to not work with a bunch of fraudulent, shady people. And the next year I did 23 million. So literally 23 X the business in one year because I decided to, instead of resisting the scary unknown to just embrace it. So I just think it's a really important and vital principle. And I wanted to share with you guys. And with that being said, Ed Ray, let's, uh, let's jump in. Let's answer some questions. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. So first up we have the legendary Sean Caesar asking, will mastering emails make writing long copy or direct response easier? Cool. What's up, Sean? Uh, hi again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Always good to have you. You're a friend uh, of the show, as they would say in the radio business. Thank you, thank you so much. That, that's a pleasure. Yeah. Um, well, yeah my question yeah, was that, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, that email is a, is a short version of the direct response. If mastering emails are like my, well, my main question was, I should start with emails first and ignore the long sales copy or sales pages and master emails first, then get comfortable with them and go to direct response or just go with direct response and, and learn with the mistakes. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think there, there's not like a single answer. The thing about mastering email first is that it is easier. It, it's easier to write good emails and they're shorter. You know, there may be like, hundred words to, to 250 words. So it's less time consuming. If you look at it from like a perspective of an hourly rate, it can get you to a pretty good hour, hourly rate really quickly. So say you charge $50 an email or $40 an email, and you can write an email in a half an hour, then you can essentially make $80 an hour, uh, which, you know, if you have been were making $20 an hour or $15 an hour before, that's a really nice raise. Uh, and of course, longer term, you can charge for like a couple hundred, a couple hundred dollars for an email and potentially make $400, $500 an hour, stuff like that. So there's that part's awesome and it's easier to master. Uh, but the challenge is there's, there's more competition probably like there's more people who can do emails because they're easier and it's, it's, it's not as hard to master. So if you're, you know, an email specialist, there's always going to be opportunities, but there's gonna be more competition versus if you get really good at long form sales letters, then, there's lots of people out there writing long form sales copy, but not very many of them are good. So if you get really good, then you can command way higher prices and fees and you'll have less competition ultimately. Like I don't have competition. If somebody wants to like, the best copywriter, like in the role to write something for them, uh, like they come to me, not that I'm, I am the best in the world, but like I'm one of the best out there who will still take on clients sometimes. And so I have very little competition. People just come to me. They, and and um, so, you know, I, I can see it working both ways. I, I guess, where, where are you at right now? Are you, 
do you have some clients already or are you kind of looking for your first client still? No, but I don't have. So I'm just, uh, I, I said, what should I start with? Because I have learned right. the basics and doing some samples. And I thought, like, should I start with email or direct response? And the question comes. Well, I think in direct response is also, you know, emails are also direct response. Because even, even in an email, you're probably telling them to click a button or, you know, take an action or whatever it is. Um, so I wouldn't really uh, differentiate it between email or direct response because I think your emails are still going to be direct response. But what are you more interested in? What, what is more exciting to you? For me, uh, the direct response or the sales pages, like I, I fell in love more when I'm writing them than the emails. Like I, I enjoy them more, as, as Ed said. Like I enjoy them more so much like when I write the, the uh, sales pages especially the research, the, all these stuff. That makes sense. So, yeah, I, I mean, and again, I don't think it has to be in, in either or because, you know, I, I, if I were me, I would focus on getting good at long form, like sales pages, since that's what you're more excited about. And generally, when you have more passion about something, you're going to be more successful. It's a pretty, pretty well-established like law of the universe. Uh, but if opportunities to write emails come along, uh, then you know, I think you can still take those to, to get experience, get gigs, bring in money and all that kind of stuff. But I think based on that, if I were you, I would focus on long form simply because it's, it's tough because again, the email stuff is easier, but there's just so many more people doing it that if you can get good at long form, you're just going to have more opportunities ultimately than uh, with emails. Okay, good. I got it. Like, so I have... This is not just in copywriting, like in all the other areas. If I'm interested in something, even though if it is something that is much easier than that, so I should go for this. Because I found that when writing emails, like it is, like emails take so much fun of the writing process. It is just a few words and you got to deliver one idea and that's it. You can't play with your words. I like can't play with the, like the bullets and the headline and testing you know, and different versions. Like I can do with the sales pages, but so many people said no. Like they they make made it sound logical that you have to start with emails because they are easier. And when you can be good at emails, you will be good at uh, long form copy. But now I gotta like uh, I should go for the long form. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah, happy to happy to help. Cool. Ed, uh, who do we have next? Beautiful. All right. Next up, we have Mr. Josh Knox. We have some repeat people come back on. I love it. So of course, Josh, you, we'll, we'll get to new folks too, of course. Don't you worry. Oh, uh, if you're, always, always. If you're new. Yeah. These are just the top voted questions. Sure. So Josh Knox asks, what's a good metric for cold traffic conversion on lead gen? Short story. I went with your recommendation last week on focusing on lead gen and our current task is producing leads. Just want to know where to focus my attention and how I can move the needle. What's up, Josh? Hey, how's it going? It's good. You know, last week you had to wait till like the very end for your question. So you're getting in a lot, a lot earlier this week. Yeah, I got That's uploaded good. this week. It's kind of nice. People, Thanks, man. People might get sick of me though towards the end. So. I mean, I'm sure they will. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, so um, started running some tests this week on the lead gen stuff. Changed a little bit of the copy on the site to be able to run those tests. And we're... We're converting right now at like two and a half to 2.7% um, in terms of, hey, they're filling out the form, they're giving us a legit number for us to call. And then from there, if they fill out our form, we send them into the thank you page that says, hey, you can book a time with us too to really talk about what we can do for you. And that is, if they land on that page, that's converting at like 18%. So it feels like the numbers are good, but I don't really know. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not running a ton of lead gen stuff. So, and especially the cold traffic, I actually am going to in the coming months uh, with like the freelancing course I'm doing and other things. So, uh, you know, com completing the, the, the 18% to like book a call out of like the people who fill it out who do kind of submit their information seems decent, but Ed, you may have done more lead gen stuff than I did back from your time with your previous position. So I'd be curious uh, if you have any good 
uh, kind of numbers or metrics or, or thoughts on that? Dude, I'm, I'm the same every time. At the end of the day, it's about money in, money out. Uh, what's your, how much money do you want to spend to acquire a customer? That's all that really matters to me. Uh, I mean, it's like probably a way better answer than what I was giving because it makes sense. <laughs> what's like, what's, what's your cost per acquisition? Uh, and what is your uh, AOV? So if, and he, Josh is on high ticket, right? Uh, it's not high ticket. It's like um, merchant processing. So oh, okay. it's, it's essentially like where you pass all your merchant fees on to your customer. And uh, I think there's like a, okay. is there like a startup fee, Josh, like a monthly fee or something like that? I think he said there's none. Yeah. So it's not high ticket. It costs you nothing to start with us. We actually save you money. So there's not, that's why it's difficult. Um, it's, and it's difficult for two reasons because I don't have any data that tells me what an acquisition cost is for me because it's always been in the past boots on the ground based on okay. sales. So mm -hmm. this online sales, I don't have a metric for. I can tell you that on average, each account that we sign up generates $300 in revenue. It's, it's really net revenue for me or net profit for me, $300 per account that I sign up. So if you take that and multiply that out over what a typical agreement would look like, it's 14,000 plus in revenue and net profit. So theoretically you could say if I spent 13,000 and I made a thousand, now that's over time, right? But I could spend quite a bit of money to acquire somebody so long as they stayed with us long-term, which we know they do. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead, Ed. Thank you. So I think find out your, your lifetime value and how, how deep you want to go in the red on acquiring that customer uh, and how, how big your cash reserves are. Uh, so this becomes a bit of a different game from what's a good metric to how much are you willing to spend to acquire a customer in the long term, and how can you outspend your competitors? Because if you're, right. if let's say the average person sticks around for th six months, that's let's say that's the number, and let's say, you know, over those six months, the average money you guys make from this customer or client is you know, three hundred bucks a month for whatever reason. Okay. Or actually, let's say it's a bigger account. Let's say a thousand bucks. Okay, so now you know what the LTV is over the first six months. So you got to ask yourself, how aggressive do you want to be? I I think Agora, they spend up, I think sixty percent of total LTV on acquiring a customer. So let's say. Um, that you decide that over that six months, that customer is worth a thousand bucks to you, Josh, uh -huh. you'll be willing to spend $600 to acquire them. Yeah. So, yep. and when you do that, that's when you can really go balls to the wall uh, and spend more to acquire that customer. That's how you scale up really fast. Uh, and that's how you are able to get more customers and far more customers than your competition because you can outspend them. So if, because most people in this game, they're worried about being profitable on the front end. That's not the point of the front end. That's not the point of acquiring a customer for the most part. I, I know Stefan's wincing at me, but. No, you're, you're, you're right. I'm not, I'm, I'm <laughs> wincing because I personally prefer to profitably acquire customers on the front and, end. And that's, that's How, cool too. Right. But that being said, to your point with lead gen, you're completely, you're completely right. And I put in the chat, I was like, I'm so glad Ed is on this call because my brain wasn't going in the right direction. I was trying to answer like an appear like such a straightforward answer, but you're going to where the, the root of it is, right? Which is, is I mean, if you look at uh, Natural Health Sherpa or, you know, Warrior, um, Warrior Maid, who both presented at the last Copy Accelerator event, and both of them, I think Natural Health Sherpa is at 70 million a year. Uh, Warrior made, I'm not sure what they're at, but they acquire something crazy like 2,000, 3,000 leads a day, if not more. 
Um, and I mean, even V shred, they're acquiring like 10,000 leads a day and, um, they're, they're doing it and they're not worried about what their lead conversion rate is. They're worried about, you know, you know what's my ROI going to be, or again, you know, what is it? What's my LT, which, which ROI is essentially, okay, what's my cost per acquisition today? What's my LTV? And then how much money am I comfortable being out or, you know, how much can I, can I play the spread, you know, into those two things align? Cause you don't want to be so leveraged for cash that, uh, you know, you're going to get money in, in three months from now or six months from now, but you can't pay the bills today and you have to shut down, which happens people. That's the, 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 the risk of, of doing it that way. But it's also to Ed's point, I mean, it's completely inequivocally can't talk today, but inequivocally, unequivocally, he's right. He's unequivocally right. Unequivocally right. It's, it's really, really, really important. So, I mean, Josh, and, and you're, Cause you're like a, you basically are CMO of this company, right? Unequivocally, yeah, it's, Jazz it's, Courtney. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's just me in the market. That's the title, but it's just me in the marketing department. So I, if I outsource anything, I go to Fiverr to outsource it or I find some other place to do it. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I, the good news too, I mean, there's a lot of like lead gen people out there who do a really good job of lead gen. So you could always even just, go to like a, like to the outsourcing kind of consult with somebody um, who's crushing it with lead gen and kind of have them help to optimize your funnels. But again, the, I think that the metrics are really, you know, what kind of budget do you have? How much are you willing, if you really knowing the LTV, because again, if you think that they're worth a thousand dollars, but your stick rate, the amount of time that people stay is actually only three months and you think it's nine months or something like that, that obviously changes the economics drastically. Uh, but um but yeah, I really think that's the way you should be looking at versus is this like a good conversion rate on like the CPL, um, your cost per lead or whatever it is. Yeah. The, so, I mean, I, I, and I agree with you guys and I not understand the complete concept of how, however much it takes to acquire a customer. Uh, the reality is, is we have people stick around for 90, 97% of our clients stick around. So right. And they're long-term contracts because we take care of them. So you, the numbers work for us. Like the, the leads that I have coming through the door right now are costing me 20 bucks, 50 bucks, hundred bucks. That's nothing in terms of the long-term value of that customer. So, um, but I'm trying to figure out like wh where are these things? Anyways, I, I think you guys answered my question quite well. So. Um, it's just a matter of what the numbers are on my end. But, and I've just so you know, I've been following uh, Mike. You introduced me to him at the Copy Accelerator event, and right. I traded just one message with him, and then he got busy, which is totally understandable. But I'm in his, I'm in his funnel, and I get his emails, and I like what he has to say because he is about lead gen. He just happens to be, and he is a business to business lead gen, which is essentially what I am, right? So. Yeah. Uh, he just has a higher ticket offer. I, and I probably would go with Mike if I could outsource at the moment. I'm just not at that stage yet, but I get what you're saying. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. Happy, to, happy to help Josh. And Come back. To you as, as well, Ed. Oh, I'll be back every week. Don't you worry about it. Good. Good. One Sweet. thing I also uh, want to know just real quick before we get to the next question uh, for newer listeners and for people who are newer to marketing, a lot of people like to focus on the, the fancy metrics, the fancy, you know, cool numbers. It's like, Hey, I have a 2% click through rate, you know, like, Oh, that, so industry standard for the most, again, this is like a generalization, but let's say industry standard is like 1%. And someone's like, Oh man, this ad's crushing. It's got like a 2% click through rate. But if you're spending, you know, 500 bucks to acquire a $50 sale and you're not equipped on the back end to deal with that, you're losing money. Sometimes the worst conversion rates can actually bring you the most amount of money because what if that lead is far more qualified? So maybe what if you get 0.5% or even 0.4% conversion rate? I mean, um, CTR click through rate, but you're only spending $10 to acquire that $50 sale because the people who you are bringing in are far more qualified potentially. I'm not saying yeah. forget CTR um, because I don't know enough about the ads game, but when I'm dealing with clients, that's the only thing I care about. It's a, it's a really good point. Um, I mean, ultimately 
yeah, money in, money out, or like you could look at it as gross profit. Uh, it's even the same thing with like revenue. You'll see a lot of people who start a new business and it scales. I made this mistake too. Uh, and, but it will scale and they'll do, oh my God, we did a million dollars in revenue this month. We did two and a half million dollars in revenue. Like people get drunk on revenue numbers and revenue doesn't really mean shit. If you lost money doing it, then what was the point? And even if you weren't particularly profitable and you're not going to be like that, you don't have an LTV mechanism in place, like per what we just talked about, then the revenue doesn't really mean it. It's a total vanity metric, right? Uh, and there's a lot of, so there's, there's two sides, there's vanity metrics. And then there are metrics that maybe aren't purely vanity, but they just aren't the right metrics. Cause at the end of the day, you're in business to generate profit. And then what you do with that profit, there's, you know, it's up to you. You could reinvest, you can hire people, you can fund a nonprofit, you can buy a Lambo, you can do whatever. Like that's, that's, that's the beauty of, you know, capitalism as it exists in this, in this kind of, you know, altruistic good form. And, and you have like these, this freedom, right. Uh, but you have to generate profit. So getting kind of cop in all these like random metrics that don't actually aren't indicative of that is, uh, not, it's a real trap to try to be avoid, to avoid. I mean sure. myself cause there's a truck reversing outside. Uh, <laughs> but I don't have air conditioning set up yet. I'm putting air conditioning into the house and, uh, the next couple of weeks because it's a beach house. So in California, beach houses, like they don't have AC a lot because like you can just open the windows and get a nice breeze. But if you're recording, yeah, this is sea breeze. The window's open right now. So it's great. But like then if there's, I'm on a cul-de-sac. So there's kids like skateboarding or trucks backing up, stuff like that, you know, um, it's a soft flex. It's also like a, I thought the AC was going to cost like a couple thousand dollars and they were like, Oh, it'd be $22,000. So that was a fun, fun surprise. I and mean, to be fair, that's two AC units and like a new, like new piping and all this stuff. But, uh, I was, uh, not prepared for that. So good times. Anyway, Ed, what, um, who we got next? Great. So we have a question from Kate Vidulich says, Hey, Stefan, when you started as a freelancer and got your first big client, what was the process to get started on the project? And do you get payment up front? What's up, Kate? Oh, hey, Stefan. Good to talk to you officially. Yeah, of course. I know we've, we've interacted on email and Facebook and everything, but I think this is our first time voice to voice. So glad to us. connect here. Woohoo! <laughs> Woohoo! We did it. Um, anyway, I just wanted to ask you, like when you first got like your, like a big client, someone who you were like, oh shit, I got this person. Um, oh, sorry if I swore to, I'm not sure if this was a G rated. Um, it's, it's, it's totally fine. I swear okay. quite a bit. <laughs> Um, okay. So what was the process like from the moment you put out the number that you charge in terms of your rates to them saying, okay, cool. Um, what was the process after that? Like as the freelancer that you went through and yeah, do you get payment up front? Like, I'm just wondering the best like way to go about it. Yeah. So I generally, great question. First of all, um, I generally, well, I mean, well, let's, let's think back to like a, a first big client. Um, but I probably, I did what I would normally do, which is I try to get the whole payment up front because I'd rather have the money today, uh, and not worry about having to like try and collect it or scramble for it later. Um, I, you know, sometimes, and this probably happened more earlier on too. And, and even with like my big clients early on, uh, it'd probably be like a, uh, like a 50, 50, a lot of times there's a little resistance where it's like half up front, half upon completion. If it's like a big client who's trustworthy, I'm, you know, totally fine with that. Um, for me personally, it makes no difference. I, some people get, some freelancers have this issue where they get paid all the money up front and then they lose their motivation because they already got the money. Uh, I don't personally, I, you know, I think my mindset is tough enough that I'm like, I'm trying to create the best piece of copy I've ever written for every single client, regardless of if I got, hundred percent up front or I got 50% now and I'll get 50% at the end. So the money that I'm going to get after I finish isn't really a motivation to me. Um, but you know, some people are just more comfortable with doing that. Uh, as far as like, you know, getting them to like agree, like, okay, let's move forward and giving me, uh, you know, I'm like, all right, perfect. Uh, here's like an invoice, you know, sending them an invoice, uh, or, you know, figuring out the payment details, getting paid and then setting the expectation of how long it's going to take. So like, you know, whether it's, four weeks or eight weeks or two weeks or whatever it is. Like, here's like the time it's going to take. Uh, here's what I'm going to be working on. And 
then really it's, it's basically it. I mean, ideally they're not going to be checking in too much and asking for updates. I have a guy who hired me recently and who, uh, he did half up front, half upon completion. I've worked with him previously and, uh, I was fine with that, but he checked in, I told him eight weeks and he checked in and was like, Hey, it's been three weeks. Uh, how's it going? And I was like, Hey, I haven't done shit. Um, cause like I have it, you know, cause I've been, I, that's why I said eight weeks. It's not, it's not gonna take me eight weeks to write it. I just have a bunch of stuff going on, but if I, by giving a longer turnaround time, I can manage like projects better and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, it wasn't too complicated though. I mean, are you, so are you going through that right now with the client or are you sort of just, uh, preparing for when it happens? No, I'm going through it now with a client. Um, I just put out, uh, through the copy accelerated group, like there was a, um, opportunity and I applied for it. And so I, um, was, I mean, I'm just shifting to more freelance copywriting now. I've mostly just written my own offers, but you know, I'm excited for a challenge doing something different. Um, I just wasn't sure of the process of, um, like I put out the number, um, and then just, I mean, figuring out the number as well. Do you, a question, do you charge different rates for different types of sales letters, VSLs, copy, or is everything just the same? It's like, it's typically the same. I mean, it can be modified a little bit depending on what the project is, but, um, you know, most sales letters are going to generally be the same length and stuff like that anyway. So, you know, if it was like a, a mini sales letter that they wanted like a four to six page thing, then I would, you know, I would modify my quote based on that. Uh, but typically the way I, I, and I've taught this a little bit on these calls before too, is like, I figure out what, what's my hourly rate, mm -hmm. how long is it going to take me to complete the project? How many hours? And then apply that to my hourly, to, to that's how I get my quote. Right. So say your hourly, hourly rate is $200 and it's going to take you, uh, you know, 10 hours and it's like $2,000, right? Or if it's going to take you like 40 hours, it's $8,000. Um, I, I try and do that as much as I can, you know, within reason or, well, I guess I have set stuff, but like, that's kind of the way you can figure it out. But then once I figure out what my hourly rate is for a sales letter or uh, upsell or whatever, then it's much easier just to stick with that than trying to provide like really elaborate custom quotes all the time. Uh, it just makes life way easier when you're like, this is my rate. Um, so I would really try and like have it sort of pretty, uh, commodified. Gotcha. Okay. And just one more quick question. Um, would you consider like an eight to 12 page sales letter as long form, medium form? Uh, what, what sort of length would like, I mean, obviously you'd still follow the, the method that you teach in order to set up the copy, but would you consider that long form? Uh, eight to 12 pages. I'd probably look at that like medium form. Um, but it's also relative. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know what you charge. So like, I wouldn't undercut myself. Like, cause, cause it's sort of like a, like it's all relative to like, so say 24 pages is long form and I charge, you know, or say, say, I don't know, say like 30, 40 pages is long form and I charge like $50,000. I don't really want to cut it to like where I'm only charging a small fraction of that for eight to 12. So, but maybe it's like half what I would normally charge. Um, something like that. Uh, Maybe, but, but again, if you're only charging, if you're, if, if you're, I know only, if you're only charging, say like $5,000, I don't necessarily think you should go down to 2,500. I probably would just still try to charge $5,000. If the client's big enough, like to them, because the money's relative to the client, right? So if the client, if $5,000 is like not a big deal to the client, then charge that. Um, you know, if you think the client is kind of going to be turned off by that and you really want the gig and you, you know, money's like really important and you want to go down to like 3000 or 3500 like sure you can adjust a little bit there um but you know I, but but yeah i would probably consider it more medium form okay perfect now that answers my question as to whether you change the price based off length or anything like that so that's awesome thank you so cool. much Stefan. i appreciate your help yeah 100 percent. and i want to give you kate a shout out too because kate was one of the freelancers selected for when i had a couple of different clients like pay me and then I hire people from RMBC to do sales letters and Kate uh, did one for Native Path which is Chris Clark's company and uh, Kate Asseltine is, is um, part of Native Path team too and Kate had emailed me back talking about uh, the people who submitted and uh, she said of, of she, she had comments on a couple people uh, but Kate's was because um, I had mentioned how I thought yours was really good Kate and she said uh, I agree. She was like, it's a bit aggressive, which is, I'd always rather be aggressive to start. Um, I'm just so aggressive. Uh, I knew it was aggressive, know? but I was like, you know, we got to, let's, let's see what happens. 
I, I know, yeah, no, she said impressive use of copywriting techniques. I applaud her for using an angle outside of joint pain. I think it shows that she was looking for an intelligent transition into selling a food product since blood sugar is related to what we eat and drink. Uh, therefore, I think the premise that your coffee could cause, be causing rack blood sugar has solid potential as a lead. Um, this is a major health issue of our audience, has a lot of awareness uh, since most of them have current blood sugar issues. Um, however, like, you know, there's, there's some stuff with the aggressiveness in the story, but the point is that like, she thought it was really good. I thought it was really good. So anyone who watches this and who's looking for a really, uh, really powerful, good up and coming copywriter, you should reach out to Kate Vitalich, who is who I'm talking to right now. Wow. Thank you so much, Steph. And I'm glad I got some feedback. I was like, okay, maybe. I know. I've just been busy. I'm going to get everyone feedback. It's just, uh, I have I mean, to get you're to a busy it. dude. I mean, you're doing I so know. many things, but, uh, I appreciate that feedback. That's great. A hundred percent. So awesome, Kate. Well, I'm glad I could, glad I could help. Cool. Thank you so much, Stefan. Yep. All right, Ed. All right. Before we get to the next question, I want to also say that at the end of the day, as a copywriter, especially once you get a bit more experienced, the thing, the, the trap that most people fall into is like the, you know, the charging per words or charging per hour at the end of the day, the client doesn't care about how long you work or how long the page is if, you can, if they can get the results you, they want to get. So it doesn't matter if the page is, you know, if the sales letter is 15 pages or 50 pages, you can charge 5K for both because it gets them the result they want. Yep. So keep that in mind. 100%. 100%. Cool. So okay, next up. So full, so full of wisdom today on the day after your 20th birthday. Dude, I'm always like this. You just have to, I just have to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great. Uh, all right. So next up we have Peter Liu and his question is, since we're talking about embracing change, read your monologue. What's your opinion on surrender? Like talked about in surrender experiment experiment. Have you ever had an experience where you surrendered, even though you felt like resisting and how to turn out? Peter, what's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Good, man. How are you? Good. How are you? And great happy birthday ed super super excited to celebrate with you soon thanks bro appreciate that um yeah so i've read your email on surrender like you wrote like i think a month back yeah about how you have a lot more freedom because you're able to surrender um i was wondering if you could go a bit deeper on that because when i think about surrender i hear a lot of really successful people talk about it but i have like trouble differentiating surrender especially when you're like in a transition time in your life versus just drifting and hoping something will happen and because most of like my life the successes came from taking more responsibility as opposed to taking less responsibility so that's like what's um kind of like some seeming paradox i don't really get right now no i think yeah i think that's a great question uh to me Surrender is putting in the work, you know, still being strategic, having a plan, putting in the work, but then surrendering to the fact that there's going to be unforeseen variables and that the outcome could, could go the way you want it to or not. So it's like, it's being more in love with the process and less, less in love with the result. To me, mm. that is, is the, the key with surrender. Uh, it's not, sort of surrendering to the, the, the winds of, of life and letting them blow you around like a, like a, like a listless uh, ship on the sea uh, to get kind of like yeah. a Homer or Odyssey. But, um, but it, it, it's more about, you know, yeah, the process and not the result and, and being more detached from the outcome. I found that to be extremely powerful. Uh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have yeah. a second slight follow-up question to that. Go for it. Can I ask? Okay, so like, the in the surrender experiment where this like concept kind of comes from he talks about how he took on like some certain gigs or some certain positions that he didn't feel like taking on but eventually it kind of worked out and it got him to like a really good place um has there ever been a point in your life where like an opportunity has been offered to you but initially you're like resistant to it but then you're like yeah you know what actually i'm gonna surrender to this i'm gonna see how it turns out and has how how did that turn out for you if that has ever happened yeah it has I, you know to be completely honest with you so one I, like i'm i'm really familiar with the book cuz Ian Stanley talks about it a lot but i haven't actually ever read it 
Um, so I want to just be transparent about that. But uh, for me, as far as like, normally if I'm resistant to an opportunity, then I, that it's normally for the right reason. And I'm talking myself into doing something that I don't want to do and shouldn't actually be doing. And I end up regretting it. Uh, that's mm -hmm. not to say, however, that there aren't instances where you don't still learn things from it or have, uh, there's not like a, a benefit from, from it. You know, I, I would look at it more as for me, it's like an opportunity that I want to be doing, but something doesn't go the way I expect it to. And then I want to like, I want to fight that, but I surrender to, to the fact that it's going differently than I expected. And then that outcome has been really good. So to give you concrete examples, if I look at some of the strategic, like the partnerships and, and things I've had and like the mentorship. So I talk about in the sales letter for my RMBC course, this guy named Yi, YI, who came in and was an early mentor of mine. And there were times though where he would drive me crazy because I would write this sales letter that I thought was really good. And then he'd say like, I don't, you know, change this, don't do this, whatever he, he'd, he'd, he'd feel, I would feel nitpicky or like he, uh, or like I, I, spent all this time working on something and then him and his partners would be like, Oh, we don't want to do it anymore. And I'd get like really annoyed and talk about how oh, this guy's the worst, you know, but in reality, he was like a, an amazing mentor that then enabled me to become one of the best copywriters in the world. Uh, so, but you know, at the time I kind of like fought it and then completely transparently, you know, even with copy accelerator, which you know, my partner is Justin Goff. And for the first year, like I, I've always, I thought, I thought Justin was brilliant. I liked him as a person, but as a business partner, he and I are very different. Uh, and that was, there was some, some internal conflict for me. In, in fact, leading up to right before our first event in Austin, I sent him this long email where it was like, you know, we're not aligned on this. We're not aligned on that. Like, you know, some, some, uh, business partners get like a couple's like therapy person. Like maybe we should get a person because I just feel like I'm not being heard. And like, it was this whole email I sent to Justin. Um, and, and to what she responded really well and was kind of like, okay, oh, I wasn't aware. Like, how do you feel? And we had a good, good conversation. But what I realized after that event, which went well, was that rather than me trying to like force Justin to operate and be directly aligned with, you know, every, who I am and what I want, if I could like surrender and, and realize that he brings all these incredible assets and strengths to the table and that I then have my own assets and strengths and we can work together in harmony and tandem that we could accomplish. It's actually the end result or outcome is just significantly better, but it took me, I had to, I'm thankful for my experience because if I didn't have that experience, I probably would have just blown up copy accelerator and been like, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I can't work with Justin. Um, but because like I had the experience of realizing I was able to sit and be like kind of, uh, you know, introspective about it and think about like the fact that this could be a strength and an asset and not something that's like a problem. Um, it really, it, it, and then and it just was it was a complete game changer and then copy accelerator since then has you know totally thrived i'm happy i just um admire justin all the time but does that mean we we still don't agree on everything but now i'm not like pissed off that we don't agree i'm like all right cool like that's that's cool we don't agree like what maybe well, let me examine my beliefs and then let me get him to examine his and let's come to like you know a good kind of like decision based on that and, and it turns out to be this huge asset and strength um so that would just be a specific example. So going back, it's a long winded way of saying back to what he talks about in the book. I, I, I think we, like there are times where maybe we're resistant to something because it's a level up, right? So like we, we, we don't want to do a project. And the real reason why is because we're scared of, you know, taking a, a big shot. Cause what if we miss? And like yeah. that of course is, is, um, you know, we shouldn't be like, right. The, you have to miss in order to make it and all that kind of stuff. Right. You have to strike, have a bunch of strikes before you hit your home run whatever sports cliche you want to throw out there. Uh, so that's one thing. But if you're like, I don't want to do this partnership for these reasons and they're good reasons, or I don't want to get involved in this venture or this project, and you have like really good reasons for it, then I would not get involved in that because I, I would rather have less resistance. And I think I mentioned this on the previous call, uh, but like uh, what Joe Polish talks about, which is like elf versus half and like his, his criteria for how he evaluates the business opportunity and elf is easy, lucrative, and fun. And half is hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating. And I really look at it like from that perspective of like, is this something that is going to be an elf 
kind of opportunity or business where it's fun, it's easy, it's lucrative, like I'm enjoying doing it or a half where I'm going to just feel like I'm pulling teeth or, or swimming up current the entire time. If it's something where I feel like I'm going to be swimming upstream the entire time, then there's just life's too short. And by saying yes to that opportunity, that means you have to say no to like 10 more opportunities that could have been elf opportunities. Uh, so I just think that, yeah, that's the way I kind of approach that. Okay. That helps a lot. Yeah. Awesome. So like, yeah, be strategic, put in the work, but just kind of be surrender to the things that you can't really control and the outcomes. Is that, that yeah. accurate correctly? Okay. It's, it's so, super accurate. And I was, I was actually just talking even with my sister yesterday who just sold her house and um, talking about how they were in a position where they didn't need to sell and they could just have stayed in their house for like the next three years that they wanted to. And they ran into some, some BS, but they came from a position of strength because they weren't again, like we have to sell. Mm -hmm. uh, but same thing with, as like a freelancer and getting to a position where somebody hits me up and wants to like, you know, wants me to write for them. And I am like maybe interested and I talk to them and then they're like, well, I want to do, they want to do a weird modification. So they want me to take like, you know, a, a third of my price off or whatever. And I can just be like, Oh no, uh, sorry, not a good fit. I'm happy to recommend somebody to you. Um, and, but having that power, it gives you all, all the power because you are detached. And, and again, of course, I'm able to do that because of everything I built and having different income streams and everything to where I'm not like the project isn't going to be the difference between being able to put food on the table or not. But it's a, even that's a really powerful way to be detached from the outcome of getting a client. Uh, and what you'll find every time, even honestly, it's really scary to do it when you're starting out. But even early on, if you sort of say no more often to like bad opportunities, you're just going to find that you become really empowered the people you say no to will often then come back and agree to whatever your initial terms were. So you don't actually lose them. And it just ends up giving you so much less of a, of a hassle and a headache. And, and yeah, to Ryan Hunter's point, build an emergency fund. So you have like six to 24 months of expenses. That way you, you don't have to work for money. I think that's a really good goal for people to have Ryan. So anyway, Peter, yeah, ho hopefully that helps. It helps a lot. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy the copy accelerator part worked out. So really happy with that. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's been a, one of my favorite things I do. So I'm really, really happy. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, man. Beautiful. All right. Next up, we have a question from, let's make sure they're on. Mukhtar Abdul Razak, who asks, how, how is writing emails to project pages, sorry, to product pages different to okay I, I, I get it now how does write how is writing emails for product pages different to writing emails for sales pages since product pages aren't as persuasive as sales pages i'm assuming he means ecom what right. should you include in the email to make the prospects more likely to buy when they get to the product page yeah great question uh what's up Mukhtar? how are you uh hey hello hey hey how are you doing good man how are you doing I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah, I just I just have a question uh, regarding the, the email creatives because I watched uh, one of your webinar with Justin, and you were talking about how to uh, land our first client. So I kind of took action and I started reaching out to like different uh, businesses. I actually try to. So I took up uh, BioTrust, and I look up their their product page just to try and see if I can write email queries for some of the products. And I noticed that they don't really have sales pages. They have uh, product pages. So I just wanted to know how can I write email creatives in a way that's going to sell, you know, the products, you know, if, you know, since it's not a sales page, like, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, hundred percent. I do. All right. And, um, for, it's actually a pretty, pretty straightforward answer on this, which is, which is kind of nice. It's a clean answer, which is, yeah, typically for like a, a product page or an e-com page, the emails are going to be longer. So if you look at a lot of the emails that Biotrust sends out for their product pages, they're almost like little mini sales letters. Uh, maybe the word count is 800 to 1500 words long. Whereas for, if you're sending to like a, a video sales letter or a long form sales letter, you can get away with 150 word email or like a 300 word email. Uh, but typically the reason why they're longer is because you just have to do more selling. Right. So, um, that that's the big difference is you just really have to to sell more in the email. Um, so if you treat it that way, and I know, you know, there's several people in copy accelerator who are, who are writing for BioTrust and doing emails and the ones who've had the most success and are continuously getting hired by them to do more stuff. have been doing exactly that. They're, they're 
basically these mini sales letters and emails and uh, they work really well for BioTrust. All right. That's my question. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Happy to help, man. Yeah. Sweet. I'm laughing at Florian's comment, which I'm not going to read out loud. But is... <laughs> well, Stefan, anyone ever tell you that you have eyes that look deep into one's souls so dark? I'm not going to read the hashtag out loud, but um, I appreciate that, Florian. I'm, I'm just trying to gaze deep into, deep into your soul. Really? Yeah, Dr. Sears, Rachel, great point. Dr. Sears uses long emails. Uh, Justin, uh, when he was with Four Patriots, they... Um, they did a really long emails. And it's actually funny because when Justin teaches email copy, he often shows these really long examples and I squirm a little bit because I've always done the short, more clickbaity ones, but it really just depends again on what you're selling the page and everything. Um, but yeah. All right, All right. Ed, who, who we got next, bro? Yo, we got my buddy, Yusuf Kapoor. Yusuf. Yusuf asks, what's your best suggestion about when someone should leave their job and pursue, freel pursue freelance full-time? I'm struggling to know when's the right time to go full freelance. I want to achieve and do more and move faster, but I feel slowed down and discouraged moving slowly because I'm working full time. Yusuf, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. It's good to finally be on. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate you taking my call. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really happy to get to chat with you. Obviously we've interacted via email and Facebook and now we're, yeah, now yeah, we're getting yeah. to interact this way. It's cool. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Are you getting, yeah, so are you that's, getting, that's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry. What were you saying? No, I mean, are you, are you getting clients right now? I mean, do you, do you, are you getting income as a freelancer right I now? I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit slow, but I'm, I'm kind of picking up slowly. Um, that, that's the thing. I know it's like a, a big thing. If you're not getting clients or if you're not, you know, making too much, you can't obviously leave right away. But my struggle was with like, I, I find that I'm really slowed down and kind of discouraged sometimes when I'm, I can't do as fast as, as much as I can or, I know that I can do um, if I were to do this full time or if I had these same amount of hours where I could really like put all into it. But um, so th that's why I'm kind of struggling with when I should know that, like when can I, uh, like when's the right time to kind of go freelance basically. Like, cause some people do it before they're ready and they kind of make it happen because that's just what they needed. Just needed more time and more hours to like put into that. But for me, I'm struggling between like practicing, studying and, and reading copy and learning and all that and doing all that while, like having a full-time job at the same time. Right. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to figure out when it would be the right time or when yeah. is wise to do that, I guess. Yeah. For me personally, I mean, I like, I did, I did like burn the boats. I got like Ooh. hired off, you know, warrior forum for two sales letters I had two ninety seven in my PayPal account. Yeah. You know, it's not fair. Actually. I didn't burn the boats. I, I spent a couple of months, like still at like two or three months at the job still, but, but honestly, I kind of like, stopped going like i stopped doing half the stuff i was supposed to do for the job mm -hmm. um and i just was like spending more time uh like focused on client stuff and then i also was very um but i would take on any kind of work right like I, as a mm -hmm. like copywriting is great but i was on upwork like applying to just every it was elance at the time but like every job imaginable because like i just want to make sure i'd have the income coming in so right. um I would, you know, I did the content web copy wrote like reports for people. I wrote somebody's like art history paper, somebody else's like senior thesis. Um, I, you know, taught myself WordPress. People were like, can you build a website? And I said, yeah, I totally can. And then I like, you know, was building WordPress sites for people, um, doing SEO for people, all kinds of stuff. Dude, I crushed it on the art history paper, by the way, just saying he got an A plus. Um, and he was like, I think, I mean, I'm surprised he got caught for plagiarism because he was not like that good of a writer himself. So I, his professor probably didn't care enough, but nailed it. Um, but so, so that's the thing. I mean, you have to just, you know, if you quit your job, it doesn't mean you're going to start getting these really good, you know, kind of perfectly aligned projects that are going to be, you know, sales letters or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like if it were yeah. me again, I would just um, really try to like, you just have to hustle, but I can't tell you, obviously, I, you know, that's a decision you have to make. I don't want the, the weight or responsibility of, uh, you know, telling you to like quit a job and, and then like, yeah, it doesn't go well and, and you're homeless and it's my fault. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think generally, do you have money saved? Like, can you, can you live a couple months with, you know, with no, with no job or are you kind of month to month? 
No, I could. I have some a uh, bit of money saved, probably a couple months. Um, yeah, I, I do have a bit of money saved, but uh, but I'm it's so, I'm just so hesitant because like I know I know people who have kind of left early and then they thought you know things would work out so nicely and stuff, but then it just ended up like really screwing them over. So I didn't want that to be kind of you know I don't want to take that kind of risk if it's not like a smart decision to make. So uh, that's why I was that's why I was kind of curious to know. Yeah. I mean, it is a risk, but like that's, you know, there's, there's asymmetry at play, right? Which is like taking bigger risks, like leads to bigger rewards. So, um, you know, having it be a bit of a risk is okay. And it's okay to take a swing. Do you have like, I mean, the other thing is like, do you have, um, do you have like a kid or anything? No, I don't have. Okay. No well, kids. I'm married, but I don't have kids. No. Yeah. Do you, do you like own or rent? I rent. Okay. So, I mean, you have to think about too, though, like what is like the worst case scenario that happens if you, what, what, what industry, what's your main job right now? I just work in like a, like a warehouse supply chain type, uh, type of work. Um, and do, I mean, do you think you'd be able to get another, how, how long have you been in that job for? About a year. Yeah. About a year. yeah. And I think with warehouse work, you know, I would imagine you could get another job pretty quickly because I know a lot of places are actually like understaffed because of like COVID and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Um, so I think one thing to put into like the the calculation is that, you know, what happens if you take this this the swing and, and take this risk and it doesn't work out? Like, can't you just go back to a job if you, you know, in a couple months from now? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking that too, but then I guess because of this whole situation, I wasn't sure what what that would look like if, if I were to, um, if I did need a job or whatever, I didn't really know how the market is and stuff. So I, I thought about it, but yeah, I guess, I guess I could do that as well. If like worst case scenario. It is. And, and then the challenge there, and Peter Lutus mentioned mindset. Um, you know, the, yeah, the, the thing is like, I like thinking about that. Cause like we, we make so many of these decisions in our life, these like all or nothings and it's like good and bad. It's, it's good because you should be committed. Right. But mm-hmm. It's also, it prevents us from, from taking risks because we're like, we, we sort of act like it's this absolute thing where if I leave yeah. my job, I'll never be able to get a job again. And it's like, that's probably not true. Um, so I, you, know, you don't want to have it as an excuse, like where you kind of leave, but then you only sort of half put in the effort. Cause you're like sitting there like, well, I've got the safety net to fall back on. For the same reason mm-hmm. that lots of trust fund kids don't ever exactly. like, crush it. Right. Some, some do. I know, I know I have one friend who's a trust fund kid fucking wildly rich and he works really hard and it's awesome. But then I know mm-hmm. some other kids who are trust fund kids who don't, you know, haven't done anything of value in like forever. But, um, but I think, uh, but yeah, I think if you, if you can really hustle and you don't mind, it's not gonna be, it's gonna be more, it may be more work and not less work. Right. And again, I would go back to yeah. just, if you don't mind hustling, getting random jobs, like create a fucking Fiverr account and do some weird mm-hmm. thing where you're like, I'll write, you know, a hundred subject lines for you not hundred, like 10, you know, and then you upsell to where you yeah. get maybe, you know, $40 or $50, but you can do it in an hour. And like, you're going to have to find aggregate like your income through a mm-hmm. bunch of sources. Um, but you know, if you're comfortable doing that, then, um, and it's easier to do it now. It's not going to get, if you know, if your wife has a child or you have a kid or you get a promotion, it's probably only going to get harder. But, mm-hmm. um, that all being said, it is ultimately up to, you you know what i mean like um i, yeah, I don't yeah. want to tell you defini- definitively but i mean mm-hmm. i guess tell you what my experience was like yeah no 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 for sure i i, I get what you're coming from where you're coming from so i appreciate it thank you so much that uh gives me a lot of clarity <laughs> a lot cool. more awesome. cool happy thank to, you thank you so much yeah ha- happy to happy to help all right sick <clears throat> next up we have Gurleen Singh, she asks, do you ever write copy for products you don't agree or vibe with? What are your thoughts on that? Some people are dead set against writing for certain industries. Yeah, what's up, Gurleen? Hello? Is hey. It... Oh, hey, what's up? What's up? <laughs> what's up? Uh, not much, not much. Um, so uh, I guess the reason why I'm asking this question is just kind of, it's just something that occur- occurred to me uh, recently. Uh, someone else, um, sorry, I'm trying to use, not to use like names or specifics, but basically they came to my attention that, um, certain copywriters are just so dead set against specific 
uh, niches, niches, which is, which is fine. I mean, to each their own, but I was just wondering what your thoughts on it were. Um, like in the beginning, I remember you mentioned something like, oh, you just took whatever job you could get. But now I'm kind of wondering, like, do you want, well, you don't still exactly do that, but do you say no to certain projects simply because you're not just not into the project or the product? I mean, I, I do, but it, it's, it's generally more because the, uh, product is like boring or generic than anything else. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, you know, for me, like, so for example, if somebody is like, I've got a probiotic and it's going to crush it. I'm like, I don't want to write a probiotic offer. I've done a bunch <laughs> of probiotics. Um, you know, uh, my, my feelings on this are, I, for me, like with health, for example, like really the only thing I didn't want to like write about was like cancer just cause like having my, my dad having died of cancer. Yeah. Um, it just was like, I don't want to like promise somebody that they can cure cancer and give them false hope. Mm -hmm. Um, but it also depends on your belief. So for example, like I've, I've hung out with like Harvard doctors who are like, you can reverse diabetes in 30 days, like a hundred percent. And like, you totally, you totally can like literally like you change your diet, not in all cases, but a lot of the time, if somebody changes their diet and goes to like a Mediterranean diet, more of a whole foods, plant-based diet, like exercises more, you can just straight up like reverse diabetes. So for me, like saying, you know, for an info product, you can reverse diabetes or for a supplement, you can lower blood sugar or whatever. Like that never bothered me because I, I do believe it. I think some people, you know, feel like if they don't believe that you can, you know, if they, if they think the only way you can get these outcomes is by going to like a doctor and taking a medication, then I can understand how they're going to be more resistant to it. Um, I will say that it's more fun to write for, you, you generally, when you, when you actually like the product, you're going to do a better job. You know, yeah. um, it, it's like more, when you're more aligned, you're going to be more excited, have more energy, have more enthusiasm, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I do think also earlier on, I sort of felt like the ends justify the means and that a, it's like, I'm just trying to eat, put food on the table, pay my rent, whatever. So like, I was not very picky yep. about a product. Um, and then I also feel like, you know, like I, cause I don't, I don't feel like morally, there's a couple like health offers I wrote like really early on that were sort of like really aggressive, like say something about how you can reverse Alzheimer's, which I think the products really did help. Like there was, they're based on science, but like, you know, I think maybe the claims were a bit too, uh, hardcore. And then, yeah, there's one at, that everyone's talking about in the chat, but like I wrote like a, um, a promo for like the lottery and how you could, you know, win the lottery more frequently. Um, yeah. and, and to be completely honest with you, like for that one, I just thought it was like funny. I, 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 so I, <laughs> I, I enjoyed writing it. Cause I'm like, this is crazy. I can just convince somebody that they can buy some product that will show them like a, a lotto, you know, cheat code or hack, like people will really believe it. And so I actually was like, I, I loved writing it. Cause I, it was like a wild story and it was like a, you know, exercise in the power of like writing and, um, psychology and all this stuff. So I, I honestly like thought it was like hilarious and amazing. Of course this was, you know, like in 20, like 14, so like six years ago, which isn't that long, but it is long. Like we're different every year. Right. And, yeah. um, so I wrote it, loved it, did really well. Um, it, it's great copy, but you know, then like I kind of Googled it and saw people talking about how like, you know, I'm on food stamps and I really hope this helps and blah. And I was like, Ooh. Oh, Oh, ooh, I'm a piece of shit. Right. Ooh. But I had to, I, I just wasn't thinking like about it at the time. So there's been times where, you know, it's like, there, there's, there's, you know, maturation happens, which is why I also talk about like what my one thing I hate is like somebody who, who sees you in one place in time. And like, I always think of this as like the ex-girlfriend status. I, I'm, I'm a guy, so he's an ex-girlfriend. Cause it's like your ex-girlfriend is you're always gonna be the same guy to your ex-girlfriend, right? It may <laughs> say thing for your ex-boyfriend, but like, I, I'm speaking from a male perspective. It's like, you know, 10, like I, you know, 20 years later, some a girl I did in high school, I'm like, I'm never going to be anybody different. Cause like, I'm just caught, but, but it's not yes. just like ex exes who, who feel that way. It's, it's like other people from your past as well. And I hate that because you know, you're saying that humans can't change, evolve, improve, become better, you, you know, spoke all these sorts this, of things. Actually. I um, did. Uh, I mean, email, I think you sent out a couple yeah. of things. What did you do your, uh, Coke cocaine? Yeah. Guy? <laughs> yeah. 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 My, That's um, funny. yeah, my, my former, I wrote an email about it for people who don't know to my list. And it was about how, yeah, my, um, this guy who was like my Coke dealer when I was like addicted to Coke when I was 20, 21 and, and working for a music business, well, 19 to 21. And, um, how, you know, the, I was addicted. This guy was a Coke dealer, but now this guy is like in internet marketing, has a family and a kid and 
is hiring people and is like, just like doing all these amazing things. I'm, you know, went on to become a great copywriter and I'm helping people. So it's like, you could, you know, somebody who can look back to that one period of time or who knew me then and be like, Oh, like, you know, that guy's a cokehead. But it's like, yeah, like I, you know, whatever, 15 years ago, uh, I totally was, but like, then I changed and like this guy, like, Oh, I got a drug dealer. It's like, yeah, 15 years ago. And he's totally changed. And I think the importance of that is, is, is again, that we, we do evolve and change. So um, that's a really long winded way of saying that I'm pretty flexible on copy. I don't really judge people. Uh, I don't, you know, again, like complete bullshit miracle cures. Like I, I don't want to do it cause I don't want to feel crappy about myself. Um, mm -hmm. you know, bullshit. Like, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a lotto product today. Right. Like I would feel, yeah, yeah. cause I would think I would know about the consequences and realize that I'm putting more negativity out into the world. Um, but I don't regret that I did one because at the time it was like a way to pay my bills and I thought it was funny yep. and that's just who I was then. Um, and I've changed. So does that, does that help? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's why I wanted to ask you a question because I knew you, you would just dive deep <laughs> and, take, <laughs> and take an angle that like I wouldn't have thought about because as far as I go, it was like, oh, I can see why some people don't because it kind of becomes like a moral, moral conundrum, I guess you could say. Yeah. But, um, no, yeah, no, thanks. That was very, very helpful. Always nice. Yeah to hear your thoughts on random things. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, I'm always, always happy to share my thoughts on random things. So appreciate the question. <laughs> All right. Thank yeah. Next up, we have Eric Butts. Eric asks, when running Google ads, what are your thoughts on the ad going straight to the sales page versus some other page trying to get the email first? What's up, Eric? How are you? Man, how's it going? Happy birthday, Ed. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. If you can hear me. Um, so, yeah. so stuff from, I mean, you know, I'm in the RMBC course. I'm, I'm doing that. I'm going through the whole thing. I'm just finishing up the copy section today. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with it, um, with the Google ads. So right now they're getting decent clicks, but they're not converting. And I'm wondering, should I be doing more lead capture or should I just go for the sale straight up? What, two, first of all, what time is it where you are right now? I'm in Atlanta, so it's uh, almost two thirty. You gotta drink some coffee, bro. I hear you yawning. We need. I need. I need. I need your energy. Uh, I'm. I'm teasing you, but I just heard the yawn mid question. Um, <laughs> I'm just totally teasing you, though. Um, but what? Um, okay. What are you? What are you selling in this? Because like, what, what's the product that's being sold from the Google Ads? This is the resume writing course. People who are looking for jobs, trying to get hired. Okay. Perfect. Cool, cool, cool. And. Okay. So right now you're running Google ads going and you're have you, right now you're going primarily directly to the, the sales page, right? I was going to the sales page and right now I'm going to like a, um, like a, a quick cheat sheet kind of thing. Like do these five things to make your resume better in the next 30 minutes. Cool. And are people for the cheat sheet are people, is that a free, like free with like an opt-in thing when you opt in, you get the cheat sheet. Yeah. Okay. And how's, how's the opt-in rate been for that? Yeah, it's okay. Like it's, I mean, low or mid teens, something like that. Like I feel like it should be higher, but it's better than zero. Yeah. The thing I would, I mean, I would, so first of all, I would go back to what Ed and I talked about earlier with, with to Josh Knox, you know, the idea of like, really like the goal is like, you know, what's going to lead to, you know, ultimately the money, money in type thing, like to, to profitably acquiring people. And if like, you can do that through lead gen and that's a better avenue to go, then, you know, that makes sense. Um, you know, it's hard to say like Google is notoriously tricky in general though, for like straight sale and going direct to like offers, uh, conversion rates are generally pretty low and it takes a while and a good amount of money to dial, dial in something like, so whereas with Facebook, you can go direct to an offer a lot more easily just based on Google and this algorithm and the traffic and all this kind of stuff. Uh, typically with Google and I've worked with Google experts in the past, it takes like, they, they warn you, they're like, Hey, it's going to take a couple months and you know, $5,000 a month or whatever. And they told you at know, first, the conversion rates are going to be like almost zero and your CPAs are gonna be a thousand dollars. Uh, but then it'll get better. So if you're really comfortable with like Google and, and maybe you know all of that, uh, you know, maybe that's one thing, but if you're kind of like, not, I mean, how, how good are you with Google ads? I guess is a question. I, I wouldn't say I'm good, but I, I've done my homework, right? Ultimate guide to Google AdWords, you know, the whole Perry Marshall thing. And so I'm dialing in piece by piece. So I, I feel like on the 
ad side, I'm good. Um, I, I went and I was tweaking the landing pages because of the quality score. So the quality score is good. And now I'm trying to figure out what to do with the, the page to get the conversions where I want. And I, I can afford to invest some on the front end, which is part of why I'm asking the question, do you go for the sale or not? And get these um, people who are more pre-qualified like Ed was talking about. So that, that's what I'm just trying to work through in my head and see like, is that what people do or am I just off, off the deep end here? How much is the, uh, does the resume kind of building like course uh, cost? I'm still messing around with that too, trying, trying to test it. But right now I'm hovering at uh, 97 and I'm considering playing with 197. And then also either bump or upsell where I actually look at their stuff after it's done, if they want to do that. Right. So cool. That, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I mean, you know, are there competitors who are doing similar products at similar price points? There are competitors doing similar products at lower price points. And then there are competitors who are like, when you talk about the, the, um, unique mechanism of, of, of the solution, the thing mm -hmm. that I offer that, that they, that I'm still in the business about you as a copywriter and a, as a copywriting teacher, like I'm still doing it every day. Like I am the hiring manager, so I can tell them directly what's working right now. Yeah. Which is great. Um, so, but I do, I do wonder like, cause I mean the, the, the other thing that'd be interesting to test is like, I know you're thinking about going higher, but like, if you've got something like with Google ads, it's like notoriously tricky, especially early on. And then you've got like a price point that's higher than everybody else's. Um, you know, that may be, may be pretty hard to get those front end conversions and, until you get it really dialed in um, versus like, if you actually start with like a lower price point and test that, it may actually be the smarter decision instead of going higher. You can always raise the price point later, but yeah. um, that, yeah, that that's sort sense. of, yeah, that's thing that stands out to me a lot. Cause it's like, you know, it's, 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 I love premium pricing as much as everybody, but uh, you know, we have to kind of like, there's a reason if everyone's doing it one way, it's always, it's kind of good to start there sometimes and then, and then innovate from there. Um, so I'd probably test, that reminds Sorry, me of one other thing. I, I had a different offer and I did like a birthday, like I turned 37. So I sold the other offer for $37 and a lot of people jumped on that because it, it was a deep discount. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll tinker with that too and, and see, see what happens. Yeah, I do that. And then I think like, you know, if it were me, I'd probably play more with like, well, I would test that and then, you know, depending on that, then if you can get the lead gen to convert because you're getting the list and you've got a good email sequence and you're creating value, talking about yourself as a hiring manager, painting a picture of like, you know, all these things that they're not thinking of, talking about how you're the expert who can help them get hired and then like, you know, reminding them of the course and, and promoting it to them through like a good email sequence and you're getting good engagement. Um, sure. I can see that being very, uh, you know, definitely working. Um, it's just a bit you know longer to close your sale. Uh, but um, I, I think that's a good model, but yeah, it's hard without really going deep diving into it. Uh, but yeah, I would test price points and then I think, um, and then get getting clear on what the metrics are going to be on the lead gen side, I guess. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. All right, sweet. Um, and I would try, I would play Facebook too. Like some other people are mentioning there. I don't know if you've tried Facebook yet, but I just sort of feel like, um, <laughs> I got even for your, so I got to figure out how to get a new account. I don't even know why I got banned, but I definitely got banned. I'm banned. I'm banned too. Um, I've appealed like a bunch of times. They're just, they yeah, like they're like, no, I was like, what did I do? They're like, read the policy. I was like, I read the policy. I don't know what I did. I know. So, Facebook's the worst. Um, Ed, you got, so got I, some thoughts? I, I was going to say, I was gonna say it sucks to miss out on those Zuck bucks, eh? <laughs> yeah, maybe you got the connect. You can hook me up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, cool. we, we can run a whole diagnosis. Feel free to message me. Happy to help. Nice. It's a good offer from Ed. I would take him up on that. Um, but uh, yeah, but Eric, I, I, would, I, would, I would say, yeah, I, I would look at Facebook though. If you can get a new account, maybe I'm sure people can give advice. Maybe if you post in Justin and Stefan talk copy or hit up Ed about it. And because honestly, at a budget of like $40 per day, which is, I know what you put in the chat. Um, I feel like uh, that is going to go a lot further on Facebook um, versus on Google, frankly. 
Yep, that makes sense. Uh, for sure. Thanks, Stephen. Um, All right, cool. One thing I also really want to quickly note is for those listening. Uh, wait, so Eric, did you get banned on 40 bucks a day? No, no. So uh, I got banned on Facebook a while back, right? So, and I think because I used the word success, that's my best guess. This is when I was first starting out. Okay. Um, so I got banned after running one ad, basically. Um, the 40 bucks a day was the Google search budget. So somebody was asking what I was doing. So I have that 40 bucks a day right now because I was trying to get enough clicks to figure out what was going to convert without kind of blowing the bank. Got it. So that, that's what I'm doing. Understood. So for those listening <clears throat> and for you too, Eric, one of the biggest mistakes that I see, and I'll probably do a post about this tomorrow again, because it's so important. Uh, when people get their ads rejected or their account shut down or their business manager banned, they always immediately go to, Hey, I'm not doing anything wrong. I should, I should appeal this. And so you do, or they do, and they're breaking rules they didn't even know existed. And then Facebook looks at it and goes, yeah, thank you for helping us double confirm that we were correct to shut down your account. <laughs> so you get it further in the doghouse. So the, the worst thing you could do is try and appeal it. So be sure to you know, check with somebody who's a Facebook compliance expert or someone who knows Facebook well, me or whoever, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. if, like if that does happen to you, because it, it, it from, it's brutal. I mean, please do that. Because I, I didn't just appeal it. I appealed it twice because the fucker didn't give me a good answer. They and never do. Purple they confirmed do. that they were right. And I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> they never do. I, I, I guarantee I can take a look at your page and your, the way your ads are set up. I can tell you exactly what happened. All right. I'll Sweet. take it on that for sure. Thanks. Sweet. Sweet. You got it, man. Well, no problem. Thanks, Eric. Hey, let's um, let's try and squeeze in a couple more, two or three more, something like that. All right, cool. Next up, we got Ryan Hunter. Ryan says and asks, how do you get back into your work and deep work routines and habits after traveling or hosting a big conference? Yeah, what's up, Ryan? Yo, 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 yo. Yeah, see, Ryan, Ryan Hunter bringing the energy. <laughs> I've, I've had half a cup of coffee and had a late night writing session. And I'm in line for another cup of coffee, so I'm taking your advice. There you go, man. Good. Got to got to stay caffeinated, um, dude. Uh, yeah. So, how do you kind of get back in the zone after you've been out of the zone? Yeah, I mean, biggest thing is uh, like one of my biggest challenges throughout life is just like consistency when it comes to habits and routines. Because um, I've always seen how I can improve, and always thinking like, oh man, I'm not I'm not at my my A game, and. Uh, like getting back from Vegas, for example, um, you know, that kind of like threw a lot of my routines out. Um, you know, before that I was like not drinking any alcohol, not like drinking any coffee. It was on like keto. I kind of just threw all that out. And anyway, so getting back in the game, um, I was wondering if you had a particular way, you know, that you have to just like, okay, we had something crazy, like the big event. Um, or we just traveled to, you know, San Diego to close a house. Now I'm back get back in the zone quickly. I mean, my biggest thing is, um, I mean, do you have like a dedicated like workspace would be one question. Um, I mean, it's in my room right now. So I want to change that. I want to have like an office that I can go to, but with the, you know, pandemic and things, it's just, I've got a nice standing desk, uh, in my office. So that's nice, but not ideal. Yeah. Cause one thing that does help me is like, I have like, a decade workspace. I mean, I showed like the inside of my, the, the office area of like my new house, which is upstairs in the back corner. Um, so, you know, the first couple of days here, I was like not a routine. And then we ordered like a, a desk from target, which I'm going to get like, you know, a nicer, fancier desk, blah, blah, blah. But like this desk was like $70 and like the chair is a fucking piece of shit, like no support, like crappy, like the, the most base office chair you can get. Like my back is like, is aching, but having like a desk, a monitor, a chair and like a room where I can go in and shut the door. And like, it's like a, a dedicated space for work. Uh, if you're able to do that, it really helps a lot. Cause then it's like, okay, once I, you know, go into the space, like I'm in my, this is like my workspace. So I work when I'm in this room, I don't do anything else. I just work. Um, having an environment like that, I think is really valuable. Um, 
I, you know, I am, and then part of it is just, it is mindset. I mean, I think you think about how it's like, like when you come back, are you, are you just, do you not feel motivated? Is that part of it? Oh, no, I'm way motivated. That's how I, <laughs> I'm that's like, how I feel. I'm, I'm, I'm peaking with motivation and, uh, you know, and it seems I'm still pumping out things, but it's, I'm not the consistency. Like, yeah, I want, there's like that goal in my mind of just like the Zen master, just focused and able to go out and like rage face and then come back and like get back into the 6 a.m. Wake up, no coffee and like eight hours of deep work. I know that's totally ridiculous, but like that's the kind of goal. And but I struggle sometimes, particularly when I travel and I get off my routines. If I stay at home, like I get, I get in the zone, I get in this, you know, habits and it's good. But uh, even some traveling really, really throws that off. Yeah. For me, I, I, I think of it like, I, I think it's sort of, maybe I'm, this isn't the best advice, but my opinion on it is being okay with, with that. Cause you will get back into the routine. It just sometimes is going to maybe take like a day or two or three um, or four to do it. Uh, so like the way I generally look at it though is like, yeah, I come back in, but maybe I'm not as motivated. Like I've just found, I don't fight it. Like I, I, I sort of feel like I'm motivated all the time. So if I just like, I'm not feeling like yesterday, I just wasn't feeling stuff after the afternoon. So I just went outside and like read a book for like two hours. And I was like, there's a bunch of shit I should be doing, but I'm like, I don't want to do it. Like I can sit around and kind of like half do it and fight it. I'm like, or why don't I just go do what I like want to be doing right now. And then tomorrow I'll probably feel way more motivated and just get done more stuff in less time. Cause I'm like, I really have motivation. Um, and I kind of feel like it's the same thing with coming back from an event or whatever. It's like, you know, it, it's annoying. It'd be great to just come back and, and get right into like the perfect zone. But that's, I don't think that's how humans are built or how we operate. You know, um, I think like we need, you have to settle into a habit generally. And so the biggest thing I would say is like just being okay with it and giving yourself permission to sort of be a little bit off routine and then just slowly easing back in and having a dedicated workspace really helps a lot too though. Yeah. And I, I used to like get down on myself, but now I have a lot more compassion and just like not beating myself up. I'm just like, okay, you know, here's some lessons. And, uh, other question on this is like, do you have a pretty consistent morning routine that you use? Um, you know, like every time that you wake up on a good day. Yeah. I mean, it's like consistent, but it's nothing like really groundbreaking. It's like, honestly, I just, I wake up, make coffee, come to my computer, like kind of clean up my email inbox, which is maybe a nice little way of like ordering my day and feeling like I'm doing something. Um, sometimes, you know, I write my daily email and then generally jump into like deep work from like eight to 10, 10 30. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if there's like, if it's nice weather out, uh, and I've woken up, I don't use an alarm clock. So I usually wake up at five 30, but like today I woke up at six 45 cause my neighbors had a Canada day party. So when it, when it celebrated Canada for all the Canadians on this call, I was, uh, was honoring your, you know, your guys' great day of quasi independence, even though Canada day, 1867, basically was like when you guys became, you were like part of the British like empire still or whatever. So I don't really know how like you guys were that independent, but, um, you know, whatever, just saying I think Canada, I think it's actually Ed day. They, it was Ed, Ed day. Ed was going to be born on that day. Yeah. I didn't want to bring it up with my Canadian neighbors cause we were drinking like moose heads and, some weird Canadian ice wine that Laura found and, and it was lots of fun. But, um, but anyway, so I woke up like six forty five today. So I wanted to do like a walk, but I didn't. Um, but if it's like, you know, if I'm waking up at five 30, uh, I, I, some days I'll, I'll read for a half an hour, 45 minutes. And I'll also go out and, um, like, uh, just kind of like try and do like a 30, 45 minute walk or do something physical, like work out, get the blood flowing and stuff like that. Cool. All right, man. I appreciate your time. Yep, absolutely. No, I, lo I love you Canucks. You guys are great. It's just, uh, you know, your, your Independence Day is like, yeah, cool. That's the day we kind of like became part of the UK. I don't know. I just don't get it. Um, you know, I'm not Canadian, so I just don't get it. I'm sure. Yeah, it's like a quasi-Independence Day. Um, and you guys like, didn't actually become like fully independent until like the, like the 80s or some shit. From what, I mean, 60s, 80s? I don't know. If any of you Canadians want to tell me, give me a quick history lesson, feel free to. Dude, uh, I, I, I did really well in school. I hit like 90s plus while working on my copywriting business, but I did not fucking pay attention. <laughs> I couldn't tell you anything I learned, dude. It's okay, you know. Um, 
well, either way, I do. I, I love Canada. I love the Canadian people. Great love for them. Um, right, and let's do, let's do one more because I've got a, a two-hour call at 12, so 25 minutes. So um, I want to get a little break to like a little LaCroix or some shit after that. But um, ew, LaCroix. Okay. You know I love my, my LaCroix, bro. Dude, but, ew, uh, they taste like someone who read a, a, a book on what like fruit tastes like and then try to put it in a drink, but they never actually tried the actual fruit themselves. I hear you, but you probably have not had coconut LaCroix, which tastes like a like a watered down pina colada, but it's kind okay. of delicious. Okay, I haven't, so I'll I'll keep an open mind to that. There's some bad flavors and some good flavors. Coconut LaCroix, is okay. one of the good ones. You know what? There are some bad flavors of kombucha, and there's some good flavors, so I can appreciate that. I will take you up on that offer when I visit you. Okay, uh, I got a whole <laughs> whole fridge just loaded up with LaCroix. So, um, all right, let's do one more. One who, more. Who, Here we, we go. Who are we gonna do? Got a great one from CS. Connaughton. Hey, I've had a 10 plus successful, uh, I guess 10 plus years, I guess, successful career running my design agency. Despite success and recognition, I never earned more than 140 euros per year or is it pounds? I don't know. I think it's euros. So I'm learning copywriting and starting with cold outreach. Is my previous career as a designer a help or a hindrance in approaching new clients? What's up CS? How are you? I'm very good. Great to talk to you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, your approach and your, your methodology. I really admire what you've done. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm really glad to talk with you as well. Actually, you're, um, you're, you're part of a big like, inspiration for me to really commit to being a, a copywriter because I've worked with copywriters a lot and kind of envied them in their freedom and their much higher rates they would be getting <laughs> on the same projects as me. So, uh, but you really inspired me to, um, to commit to it. And I have awesome. to be in a copy accelerator within a year or two. That'd be awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah, to answer your question, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's definitely an asset and you just have to position it that way. Um, yeah. The reasons why would be a couple. There's, one is you can, you can offer like to do the design along with the copy, although I actually don't really love that because it's, it's like a bunch of extra work. But you could be like, you know, I'm also, I ran a design company for 10 years and I um, really know what page elements work and what don't work. So as you're getting whatever info you designed, I can come in and kind of like keep an eye on it and give you suggestions for what to tweak and to change. I don't really do the full design work anymore. Um, I mean, you can, if you still really like design, uh, you could do it as a value add. But I just feel like my gut tells me if you do that, then you're going to end up kind of like hating life because your projects are going to take way longer. And instead of turning the copy and being like done with it. Absolutely. Now you have to actually... I've had a, sorry to interrupt you, but I've had a few experience of doing both and it's, it's not like it's, it's worse than doing <laughs> one of these. Like, yeah. Doing both together is a nightmare. Yeah. I totally of... get it. Yeah. I think packaging shit together sounds good to everybody and it almost yeah. always sucks. So, like I, I did it with a, an agency I ran that was like, copy and then we were like we'll do everything design dev like integrations get you traffic and then it, it was a nightmare because it's like say the copy's great and even the design's good but the dev takes longer than expected now the client's pissed yeah. what if all that goes well but we have trouble bringing traffic now they're just pissed they're like well where's my traffic it's like why am i giving them all these opportunities to like you know for something to go wrong versus just focus on doing one thing really well and giving to them um but that being said going back to the design but you i think you could be like you know I have 10 years of like, you know, designing high converting funnels and whatever else. So oh, sorry, to be clear then, you see, this, this is actually where the problem comes in because like, I did like br branding design, which is like identities for big corporations, mm. multinational. So it's actually unconnected in a way. Like the design I was doing, I've, I'm sure you know how different the branding world, the direct marketing world is. They're just different universes. They, okay, totally. Very good distinction. Totally fair. But I think you could kind of not point out the distinction to people not yeah. not saying like to, to to don't lie you have to lie and say you did like direct response funnels when you didn't but i think you could still be like you know i come from a design background so i have a really good eye for design and what catches attention and what doesn't so like you know as i deliver the copy i can go through and, and provide you know insights or thoughts on what i'm seeing to help you on the design side and i frankly just spend like a little bit of time studying like high converting funnels and be like, Oh, you know, I'm a designer of design background. And I've really studied the design for funnels that, you know, convert really well. So I can help you. Cause you have like a 10 year background. I've worked with all these big brands and I really know, you know, if you just spend a little time studying what, what, what seems to be working for funnels, then you can still be like, I really know what design elements help. Right. Okay. And, with conversions. and then 
that's a huge value add. And then I think, um, beyond that, like the 10 years of experience, uh, working with big brands, I, I same thing. And, and being like, I, you know, I, the whole idea of like, I have experience, I've worked with huge brands. Like I, but I'm working with you, but like, I just, I have all these amazing insights into like what works, what doesn't work, you know, consumer psychology, all these things that the average copywriter is not going to have because they haven't actually been on the forefront building this stuff. So I think, um, you know, being able to like position yourself that way is, is really valuable. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually I just, another question occurs to me, but I guess you're in a hurry. So I'll, uh, no, that's okay. Um, Go for what, What's the question? Um, just like, what's your best tips or resources on doing cold outreach? Like, uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go on. That's, that's the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, and I, and we have, we've talked about some of the previous calls too, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I have this freelancing course coming out, but the short answer is being personalized with your messages. Like, like when you reach out to people, be funny, good subject line, personalized personality, be confident, demonstrate uh, your knowledge and expertise, sort of like, Hey, I'm one expert reaching out to another. I'm one like leader, like reaching out to another. I think the ones that are like, you know, hello, sir. I am a you know young copywriter who is struggling to you know make it and um, like I I will hope that you will give me an opportunity and I believe like you will find my resume attached and but it's like you know like you're like okay you're just some random job seeker but you're like hey what's up man uh, I was checking out your stuff I'm like a world class uh, designer turned copywriter I'm applying what I learned from consumer psychology and all this stuff to copy getting great results for clients I noticed you know what you guys are doing I'm a huge fan. Um, and you know, I'd love the chance to work with you. Ideally, like, you know, like here are some thoughts on what, you know, maybe I could ways we could work together. Um, here's a quick little video I shot showing you what I've seen on your page and there's some ideas I have for how to improve stuff, you know, just providing value. Like anyway, like, let me know, would love to chat, you know, uh, something like that, just having confidence, uh, I think is really important. And then, um, in addition to that, like, just following up is important too. I've talked about following up. Somebody actually emailed me today and told me how they, they kept emailing Craig Valentine until Craig Valentine just re replied in all caps, like stop. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry to Craig Valentine in advance for that. Who's, who's on my list and probably hates me now. Um, but, <laughs> but like at least Craig Valentine responded. You know what I mean? And now, you know, okay, Craig's not interested. Now you don't have to keep following up with him. You, once it was a stop, like stop, but like, like, all right, cool. Now I can move on to somebody else. But I think it's okay to keep following up. I don't, you don't want to be annoying, but I think if you're being funny, you have a like good subject lines. Like it doesn't mean every single person is going to be like, this, this guy is great. Like I should hire him. Some people are gonna be like, Oh my God, this guy needs to fucking stop emailing me. But like, there are people who are going to be like, damn, this guy's really determined. He keeps, e keeps emailing, keeps messaging. Like I laugh every time. And then you have that one subject line that just really gets him. Like that whole, I've been thinking about you in the shower or like, um, you know, like, your website gave me indigestion or whatever. It's some, some funny like subject line. Um, you know, you may get a response. So I really think, uh, yeah, I think follow up is, is really important. I can't tell you how many times people reach out and follow up once or twice and then stop. And you know, it sucks. I want to respond to everybody. I feel like a jerk when I don't, but I have, uh, because I'm teaching and putting myself out there so much, I just get a, a ton of, you know, messages and I can't respond to people in a timely fashion, but if someone follows up enough, I almost always will. So I, I think follow up is really important too. Fantastic. They're really great actionable tips. I'll, I'll put them out, do them this week and maybe let you know how it goes next week. Yeah, that'd be great. Please keep me posted. Great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, CS. All right. Um, well, I know you asked what the freelancing course is going to cost. I, it's probably gonna be 997 for the full course. And then we're probably going to break up a component about how to get your first client and sell that for $97 and have like a bunch of the case studies that people provided. Uh, that way, people can, you know, get that, use it to get their first client, have something really actionable. And then from there they can up level to the full course or program. So when I sell it to my list, I'll probably sell the 997 version, but then later I will break down like a $97 kind of front end version and we'll run traffic to it and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, amped about it, but everybody, we are going to end the call today. I want to say thank you so much for being on with me. Uh, Ed, I'm going to give you a chance to talk in just a second and say goodbye as well. Uh, for people who are watching this or listening to it, please make sure that if this is valuable, you are you know hitting the like button, commenting if it's on YouTube. Please share with other people. Uh, everything you can do to kind of help spread this to as many folks as possible would really mean the world to me. Uh, Ed, uh, any 
last thoughts of wisdom before we uh, wrap up here? Yeah, just keep moving forward, keep pushing ahead, and uh, don't forget to enjoy the process and love yourself. Awesome. Love it. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. I'll see you all next week at 10 a.m. Thursdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and uh, we'll talk then. Bye, everyone.